Hello, everyone. This is your right geek and honorary man king here with number one Marmaduke fan to talk about uh, C.S. Lewis's Out of the Silent Planet, the first book in the space trilogy. How are you today, Marmaduke fan? Doing all right. I found out that uh, there's an Iron Maiden song based on Out of Out of the Silent Planet. So I wonder how many metal fans uh, hear that phrase <laughs> and don't know don't know it's based on a book. The the, the reverse of my problem. <laughs> I don't know anything about metal music. <laughs> That's that's pretty awesome. Also, um, thank you for having me on as well. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. So, where would you like to begin today uh, in our discussion? Well, behind the scenes, we're kind of talking about how uh, out of the silent planet, it's sort of C.S. Lewis's galaxy brain <laughs> take on co cosmology. So, maybe something that was interesting for me. Uh, I, I've read it twice now. Like the first time you read it, it's very much a straightforward. Uh, poor, poor British guy gets kidnapped by a, a mad scientist and he has an adventure in outer space. But then over the course of the adventure, the main character, Ransom, his whole perspective changes and he can't even think of outer space as outer space anymore. It's like, it's too beautiful a thing to be called mm -hmm. space. So he starts thinking of it as heaven. So what's interesting about this book is the second time you read it, it's completely different than the, the first mm -hmm. time you read it. And it's probably one of the best examples I've ever seen of an author uh, having a character change and then even changing how the audience perceives what's happening uh, as they read it. So that's one of the most impressive aspects of it. And I, I kind of can't wait to get into uh, the, the, the medieval astronomy and everything that gets touched on here. Yep. Speaking of medieval astronomy, I have up here, I have my uh, Kindle book open on my laptop and I bookmarked some things that, that struck me as I was reading it. Uh, this is not my first time reading it. Of course, I read it back in uh, uh, 2007 as well. Uh, and that's kind of a story in itself. Um, I have told uh a number one Marmaduke fan. I, I've told our other occasional guest, Punchy, this, but back in 2007, um, as a part of our dead authors panel at a convention that I go to most years when there isn't COVID hysteria going on. Um, so the, the concept of the dead authors panel is that the panelists would basically, uh, for the duration of the panel, pretend to be an author who was no longer living and respond to questions and so on as that author. Um, and in 2007, uh, I volunteer to play C.S. Lewis for one of these panels. Uh, so in preparation for that, over the summer of 2007, I, I read, I would say 95% of what C.S. Lewis had ever written. I think the, the remaining 5% is probably his, uh, I, I don't think I got to all of his uh, like literary criticism. Uh, and I, and obviously I probably, uh, you know, you probably, no one has probably read all of the letters, although I'm oh, sure yeah. scholars are continuing to pour through that stuff. Um, but, you know, I read the space trilogy. I read all of Narnia again, cause I hadn't since I was a kid. Um, I read, uh, you know, all of his all of his major Christian apologetic works. I read *The Abolition of Man*. So I I read a whole bunch of C.S. Lewis stuff, and the result of that was uh, I was able to play C.S. Lewis in the Dead Authors panel. But it was also the other result is that I reverted to Catholicism. Yeah, in large part because of that, uh, because it basically you know I was baptized a Catholic and. Uh, it, and in terms of Catholic education, I got as far as uh, like a first grade CCD, basically, but never got any farther than that. And reading C.S. Lewis basically convinced me intellectually that the case for Christianity was true, right? Mm -hmm. So then I reverted at that at, at that point um, and started studying Catholicism. You start studying the theology of my church and in detail with. The priest of the church, so I could finish up my, uh, you know, my, you know, introductory sacraments essentially. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so funny Did, story, C.S. Lewis is the one that converted me to Christianity. Right, the, the opposite the yeah. opposite of what Tolkien wanted to happen for Lewis is what Lewis did, yeah. did for you. Yeah. Now, did you read Did you read the discarded image in your research into Lewis? Uh, I believe I did, and I also read. Um, I believe I did because I am like in my head. I have knowledge of his view of medieval cosmology. So I believe I did read that. Uh, and I also read uh, Planet Narnia in which I forget the name yeah. of the author, but that, yeah, but that author that actually went deep into that aspect of his thought. Um, I know I read that for sure. So okay. I, I keep hearing Planet yeah. Narnia brought up. So I haven't read yeah. the discarded image, but once I start, I knew that something about out of the silent planet was trying to communicate a complex idea about the heavens. So I started saying, yeah. okay, what the heck is Lewis trying to talk about here? And I've yeah. got a couple people I'll name drop. So uh, Pastor Doug Wilson has a nice presentation for New St. Andrews College on all three of the uh, Cosmic Trilogy books. And Dr. Scott yeah. Mason has a lecture series specifically on the book the discarded image. So I have I haven't read the discarded image, but it did it did help me to kind of see that I was just imagining things that Lewis is trying to say something profound about the way we think of outer space and even the phrase outer space. So I'd rec I'd recommend both of those for people who are maybe like interested in Lewis, but you, you know, you if you're not a expert in medieval li literature, <laughs> so, yeah. some of what Lewis has to say might go over your head. Yeah. Yeah, and let and let me just uh, add into that if you're if you're interested in a a very good explication of the cosmological aspect of Lewis's fiction, then the book Planet Narnia uh, uh, puts it in layman's terms. Yeah, uh, in a way that you would be able to understand without having a deep uh, idea of what how the medieval world saw the cosmos. So. Um, yeah, and like I said, I I believe I absolutely did read Planet Narnia because I think I think it might have even came out fairly recently as of two thousand seven. So um, you know, it was it was a book that was being discussed at the time, and I said, oh, since I'm playing C.S. Lewis, let's read that and see yeah. what it tells me. Yeah. So um, uh, so speaking of uh, C.S. Lewis's view of the cosmos, I actually have a uh, primed over here a passage from um okay mike it's page 30 in my kindle book so it's early in the book um and it's describing uh ransom's experiences uh as he is basically entering outer space um and uh oh i'll just i'll just read the little passage which will give us an idea of what the uh, what the general idea of the cosmology is. Uh, but Ransom, as time wore on, became aware of another and more spiritual cause for his progressive lightning and ex exaltation of heart, a nightmare long engendered in the modern mind by the mythology that follows in the wake of science was falling off him. He had read of space, in quotes, at the back of his thinking for years had lurked the dismal fancy of the black cold vacuity, the utter deadness, which was supposed to separate uh, come on, page over. Worlds. He had not known how much it affected him till now. Now that the very name space seemed a blasphemous label for this Empyrean ocean of radiance in which they swam. He could not call it dead. He felt life pouring into him from every from it every moment. How indeed should it be otherwise, since out of this ocean the worlds and all their life had come? He had thought it barren. He saw now that it was the womb of worlds whose blazing and innumerable offspring looked down nightly, even upon the earth with so many eyes. And here, with how many more? No, space was the wrong name. Older thinkers had been wiser when they named it simply the heavens, the heavens which declared the glory, the happy climes that lie where day never shuts his eye up in the broad fields of the sky. He quoted Milton's words to himself lovingly at this time and often. Um, so what we have, what we have in that passage is basically, uh, as you say, C.S. Lewis is trying to make a point, uh, he's making it a point to re-enchant the heavens, so to speak, 
uh, yeah. and to return us to that uh, medieval idea of it instead of uh, instead of simply thinking of it in cold scientific terms as space that is empty. Yep. Uh, related to that passage, maybe to kind of like illustrate the point for people who like haven't read much Lewis, like the, he, he's very good at giving you a simple mental picture for what he's trying to communicate. And I think like a child or a teenager could understand that. And then he builds on top of that. So one of Ransom's key mental pictures is he used to think of the planet Earth as an island in the middle of an ocean. And if you swim out into the ocean, you die, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas he comes to see space as the heavens and the heavens are full of life and full of light. So there's a sense in which the planets are actually less beautiful uh, or less glorious subtractions from space. And something that struck me about when he used that illustration is Lewis is actually very much aware of modern science. So he's not, he, he's not saying the earth, rev uh, he's not saying the sun revolves around the earth. He's trying to, uh, he, it, it's almost like what he's interested in, in the medieval picture of the cosmos is he's interested in the beauty and the purpose of it. And that's what he feels uh, has been lost by the modern perspective. So if you ask like a materialist, well, what, what happened after the big bang? A materialist says, well, uh, there's this explosion. There's all this dust, this dust, collects together in giant clouds and that forms stars <laughs> and planets, right? So there's actually a way in which Lewis's description of the planets as, as subtractions from the heavens is would literally be true from a materialist uh, scientific perspective, but Lewis's way of wording it puts it in the context of this more beautiful and harmonious picture of the heavens rather than a cold, dead, empty black picture of the heavens. So, and there are th little things like when they're in space, Ransom sees light more intensely than he's ever seen light before. Well, why is that? Well, because here on earth, light's filtered through the atmosphere. It's softened. He thought that if he went into outer space, it'd just be cold blackness everywhere. But he, what he actually sees is radiant light that's too intense to see e e everywhere. Uh, it, it, it's also interesting to me that Ransom's uh, journey or his change it's uh, one of the things that Lewis is very good at is every chapter and almost every sentence uh, builds to this cumulative effect of Ransom completely changing his perspective uh, about the world. He's one of the best writers I think there is for uh, paying attention to detail in, in writing. Right. So we have, so there is, um, there is a project that, C.S. Lewis is basically embarking upon here uh, that is uh, attempting to recapture uh, to recapture a, an overall worldview uh, that he feels that modern modernity and especially modern science has has robbed from humanity. He's trying to re he's trying to restore the the mythological view of the cosmos, which makes me wonder. It, it, it makes me wonder uh, if Jordan Peterson has ever engaged with C.S. Lewis at all, because I feel like Jordan Peterson might have some things to say about that if he ever yeah. attempted to do so. Yeah. I feel like Peterson, <laughs> Peterson is so interested in mythology. It would surprise yeah. me if he hasn't encountered Lewis, just because Lewis is so like Lewis is an important Christian figure, but he's also an important figure in kind of the world of, you know, English myth and English uh, po poetry, right? So it, su it surprised right. me if you wouldn't come across Lewis that avenue if you didn't come across him in the Christian avenue. Right, right. Um, I also have, uh, see, I have a bunch of things uh, bookmarked here. I have on page 38, so kind of in the same general idea here um just a quote oh yeah so you were talking about how uh he saw the the space as a void and the planets were the islands of life essentially yeah. and then he and then it completely uh his actual experience of space uh in the narrative completely flips his view so this uh this section right here kind of covers that um wondered how he could ever have thought of planets, even of the earth, as islands of life and reality floating in a deadly void. 
Now, with a certainty which never after deserted him, he saw the planets, the earths he called them in his thought, as mere holes or gaps in the living heaven, excluded and rejected wastes of heavy matter and murky air, formed not by addition to, but by subtraction from the surrounding brightness. And yet, he thought, beyond the solar system, the brightness ends. Is that the real void, the real death? Unless, he groped for the idea, unless visible light is also a hole or gap, a mere diminution of, um, dim, diminution of something else, something that is to, to bright, unchanging heaven as heaven is the dark, heavy earth. Um, so I highlighted this uh, because, again, it shows that... Uh, um, it shows uh, Lewis's fundamental Platonism too. Uh, Lewis very much had uh, a view, a view that the world as we experience it and life is is uh, a mere reflection of uh, of the heavenly life, essentially. That there, that you know, the trees and the mountains and all the things that we see on our, our created earth in heaven are they're the, the perfect forms of those things exist in heaven. So he's very much a Platonist in that way. Though it may be partially in contrast to Plato, where if for Plato, if the platonic solid is an idea of a perfect sphere or a perfect cube, for Lewis, the, per, the perfect ideal isn't like an ephemeral non-physical thing. The perfect ideal is almost a more substance. It's, it's almost like it's too more thick or more substantive than we are like one of the great great illustrations is if jesus can uh walk through a wall well that could be because jesus is a transparent ghost or as lewis would think of it that the wall is transparent and jesus is more real or more physical than the wall we're, we're the pale imitation of reality compared to that higher higher reality right uh and and you can see that in uh how he describes uh, the Eldil too. Uh, yeah. The fact that they that they exist in uh, when they enter our plane, it's like something that it's 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 almost like um, I don't know if you've ever read Flatland before, but it's like it's like the sphere entering the entering the two dimensional space essentially. So uh, uh, the Eldil, uh, he he is describing them as something that is more real entering into something that is less real. Uh, I haven't read that one, but I have read The Great Divorce, and that has a continuation of the same theme. The the yeah. spirit, the spirit, ghostly people, when they enter into heaven, heaven's too hard and too sharp and rough for them. Like they step on the grass, and the grass pokes pokes their feet because the people right. are the ephemeral things, and the divine is the substantive th uh, real right. thing. Yeah. I want to... Um, I want to talk a little bit about Ransom's character in the first couple chapters, because uh, maybe one interesting thing about uh, Out of the Silent Planet is, in addition to kind of like this galaxy brain stuff, it's also an adventure hey. story about a nerd who gets kidnapped by an evil scientist, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in in the early chapter, there are just a few little nice touches about ransom that that set him up I, I think lewis says he has round shoulders i think he says something like ransom didn't have much of a uh breezy or man of the world air about him so he's basically telling us that ransom isn't the most impressive guy you'll ever run into and ransom likes to take these walks and he doesn't know if he's going to find a place to stay for the night uh T typical of Lewis, there's a there's a nice emphasis on Ransom's internal mind. So we aren't just seeing the things Ransom does. We see things he thinks. So he agrees to help this little old lady find her uh, half-wit son. And we actually see right. that he's seemingly doing something very gentlemanly, but he's having all of these, you know, angry thoughts like, dang it, I wish that stupid woman didn't ask me to do the, this for her, right? So it Right. Externally, yeah. his behavior seems quite, you know, moral and, you know, proper British gentlemanly. But internally, he's act, he's a pretty selfish uh, guy. He, he thinks, oh, if I go and meet these professors, of course, I'm one of their class. So it, uh, it, if they offer to have me stay for the night, well, how can how can I refuse? Right? Uh, he, he thinks he thinks highly of himself <laughs> as a as a professor, and. Uh, right. When he runs into Divine, Divine and Weston are both uh, type, 
types of intellectuals, and both of them look down on Ransom for different reasons. Divine's a little bit more of a, I guess a prig, kind of, kind of has a smart, he's way too sarcastic for his own good, mm -hmm. right? And he has this holier than thou uh, mentality where, oh, well, I'm so smart and everybody else is just a sentimental doofus c compared to me. And it's clear that Divine uh, harbors that kind of resentment towards Ransom, the, the same resentment that Divine harbors for the older generation. And Weston right. is almost like uh, a nerd with delusions of, of grandeur. He believes he can save the human race by uh, yeah. get, getting us off the planet. So what we were talking about earlier, where Lewis is concerned about modern science losing something really important. I think it's noteworthy that it's, it's essentially a capitalist and a Dar Darwinian who's obsessed with perpetuating the, ra the human race that are right. the, the villains of, of the story. You know, if, if Freud reduces human beings to just like our sexual input pulses. Uh, Darwin can reduce human beings to just the desire to, uh, the, the desire to survive. Yeah. yeah. What one of them, uh, divine is almost just like purely broken and purely greedy. Whereas Weston right. has almost this noble ideal that I will save the human race. But in Weston's case, that that noble idea makes him feel justified in doing anything. He he experiments on the dog, uh, which is why they didn't have a right. guard dog to warn them of uh, ransom sneaking in. He doesn't right. see the half wit boy as a human being at all. So if if right. uh, the world was run the way Weston would wanted it, he could he'd be experimenting on. Uh, on, on the mentally disabled, and he feels perfectly justified in sacrificing the the mentally disabled on the altar of s science and exploring out outer space. So, right off the bat, we we have our mad scientist, we have our evil capitalist, and we have this contrast between uh, their view. And Ransom really hasn't developed his worldview yet. When Ransom develops his worldview, he's going to become more spiritually aware. Right now, he's just sort of a non-entity who's getting kidnapped and brought into <laughs> brought into this higher world. Right. So, um, uh, so yes, what we have in Weston, Divine, Weston and Divine is we have uh, two different captures of what uh, what being bent or being broken can look like. And uh, Lewis definitely believes that there is one version that is far more dangerous than the other. <laughs> um, uh, that divine's, the divine sin in a sense is, is on the more minor end of the scale. He's just, oh, he's just kind of, he, oh, he's the greedy guy. Um, yep, he's, and, he's broken. And on the yeah. scale, of, yeah, he's, he's broken and greedy, and he's not really that much of a threat as a consequence. Uh, you know, uh, and that kind of fits in with uh, Lewis's nonfiction in which he, you know, that, you know, if I recall correctly, he, uh, he argues many times that like the, the common prostitute or the common drunkard or whatever uh, are not nearly so dangerous in terms of the level of their sin uh, as the Western types who believe that they what they are doing is for a noble purpose. At you know, there's a there's a famous Lewis quote that floats around about um, you know the the worst person is someone who is committing evil because he thinks he's doing good for you, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So um, so the Weston is basically uh, yeah, it's basically demonstrating in character form what uh what lewis thinks about sin and what the most dangerous sins are um and i think and i think that based on our experiences to in the world today i think a lot of us would agree that the busybody who thinks that they are acting in your own good are definitely much more dangerous <laughs> than uh than the ones that are simply you know dissipating their lives in in some sort of minor vice uh, it all—it also struck me that I think I think the boy's name is Henry. But once Henry gets away, Weston uh, pretty much makes a quick argument that well, the boy wasn't even human. Uh, th this guy Ransom—he's human, but he's not a very useful human, right? So 
on one level yeah. of irony, Ransom thought that these two professors and intellectuals would see him as a peer. Almost instantly, Weston sees him as an inferior uh, in intellect. And yeah. Weston uh, makes a quick jump from people of low intelligence aren't human to people of moderate intelligence are human, but they're not that important in the in the grander scale of sa saving the human race, right? So Weston keeps pushing his yeah. idea farther and farther and farther. Right, right. He, and, he, and Weston hates the classics. He doesn't see cl the classics or literature as a useful uh, uh, way of spending ta taxpayer money. He, he kind of want, he thinks that the government should basically just be purely funding uh, practical scientific research le like his. O only my field of knowledge uh, is what matters in the end. Right, which contributes to his view that Ransom is inferior because Ransom, of course, is some is an academic who, of course, studies one of those useless fields of language. Knowledge, right, language, which yeah, will be important well, later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, to proceed with the plot, he uh, poor Ransom gets cap captured by a mad scientist and is sent into outer space essentially against his will. And we have uh, we have talked about uh, the experiences that Ransom has when he uh, in what he used to perceive as outer space. Um, but eventually they land on uh, what turns out to be Mars, though of course uh, Lewis doesn't make that explicit. He allows the narrative to make that apparent as time goes on, that that's where they are. Malachandra. Um, the Malachandra, yeah. So Malachandra, the, the heavenly name for Mars. And uh, and one thing I found really interesting uh, in uh, the opening experiences of Malachandra slash Mars uh, is the way that uh, Lewis describes uh, how Ransom perceives his environment. Um, and the, the description is essentially that at first Ransom doesn't know what he sees because it's something so completely different from what he would see on the planet earth that his brain actually can't process it, which I, uh, and there's a line in here. Um, there's a line moreover uh, on page 40, moreover, he knew nothing yet well enough to see it. You cannot see things till you know roughly what they are. Yep. Um, which, um, well, that just struck, that just struck me as someone who studied, uh, neuroscience because that's actually true that like Lewis actually struck on something that turns out to be true in a cognitive sense that, um, that your brain actually has to learn to see before you can actually see anything. Um, and from that point on your brain is doing a lot of top down processing. What you see is not you know, what you see at any one moment is not uh, directly what gets absorbed by your retinas or what gets, yeah. uh, in, uh, yeah. it's uh, your brain is bringing the data to fit its preconceptions of what the world should look like. So if you're in a completely different environment, it actually makes sense from a cognitive perspective that, that your brain would be confused. What the heck am I looking at? This is so different. So I just, I found that description uh, kind of an interest. It was uh, Lewis kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He was predicting what we would eventually find uh, in uh, studies of sensation and perception, essentially. And, and it's also close. Of course, it's, it's connected to how children have to perceive things. They don't have the words for things yet. So especially yeah. in early childhood development, things are colors and shapes and maybe fa maybe faces right like you start resolving things into simple things like yeah. oh that's my mom's face and then mm -hmm. as you learn the words for things you have you can resolve these colors and shapes into things that your mind can like lock onto uh, there's a really he has a pretty simple right. way of illustrating this ransom sees some purple right he doesn't know what the purple stuff is right. and then he thinks he sees uh maybe like spikes and then he thinks maybe he sees uh parasols that are inside out, right? And then these resolve, uh, maybe like, maybe he sees them as vegetable-like and these finally resolve into plant life that's unlike any plant life he's seen on, on earth, but it takes him a few steps to get from purple 
to alien plant life, right? So it, again, like right. Lewis explains this really complex psychological idea in a, in a way that basically like yeah. a young child reader could get that. Yeah, the, the fact that the the fact that he anticipates, uh, I, I just found it really interesting that he anticipated uh, what we what scientists in the field of you know cognitive psychology would eventually figure out. You know that yes, in fact. You know, when a child is born, the child can't see yet. It has to learn. Like it has eyes that work, presumably, unless there's been some sort of, you know, congenital issue. But at the eyes work and they receive sensation, right? But the brain has to learn over time how to interpret the what is being seen. So, right. uh, yeah. So I just I found that uh, I found that incredibly interesting because I'm sure I'm sure he. He, I'm sure he wasn't writing it that way because he was thinking of it in those terms. I'm sure he was trying to make some other point, but I just found it interesting that uh, that it does in fact line up with what is actually true about human sensation. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I want to maybe make a couple, there are a couple interesting things about the spaceship before they run away and leave the spaceship behind. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think the spaceship is a, is supposed to be another illustration of the cosmology Lewis is talking about. So it's a weird spaceship right. because you walk, it's, it's a physical sphere that you walk around and it pulls you towards yes. the center and you can, it's small enough that you can actually see over the horizon, which means that anytime Ransom right. looks at something, he looks up and it sure looks to him like he's in, uh, I think Lewis calls it a wheelbarrow. It's it's a trapezoid. The, the bottom is smaller than the top, but he walks up to a wall and he feels the wall and the walls are all straight yeah. and per perpendicular. Uh, right. And then the outside outside of it are windows. So you see out into the, the heavens. So the spaceship is literally supposed to be like the planet like the planet earth. So Lewis is reinforcing this mental picture thing he's trying to do by having Ransom physically walk around a spaceship that is exactly like how Lewis wants us to think of pla planet earth. We're walking around this spherical ball. We look up out yeah. these windows into the, the heavens. Our perception of down uh, yeah. is we feel like we're standing on a flat plane, but we're actually walking around this sphere where everywhere on this sphere is, is down. And then their perception of down yeah. changes back to normal again, as they move into Melacandra and the gravity distorts their view of reality and makes them sick. Like they, like they can't get their sea legs anymore because down yeah. isn't down for them anymore. Uh, while they're yeah. on the ship, the shutters uh, jam. And at the end of the book, uh, Ransom actually writes a letter to C.S. Lewis, making fun of him for doing uh, such a bad job writing the book. And one of his points is that yeah. the shutters <laughs> jamming is actually a really important detail. You think readers don't yeah. notice details like that. But what that sets up is later towards the end of the book, the fact that the shutters are jammed means they can't protect themselves from the sunlight at, at all. Yeah. So it just struck that there was something I only noticed the second time going through, to, which illustrates... Yeah. Lewis being careful about his details and his uh, set, his setups for later. Right, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they land on Malacandra and uh, Ransom believing that the men who have kidnapped him uh, are intending to uh, essentially offer him as a sacrifice to the local aliens runs away, right? Um, and uh, eventually comes into contact with one of the sapien species that lives on Malacandra and he becomes more familiar with uh, that society, right? Right, after he um, runs away from uh, Weston and Divine, who he believed were going to yeah, sacrifice yeah. him to the Sorns. So he gets, he gets runs, runs, runs as fast as away as he can from the Sorns, plagued by these ideas of monsters. And he runs into kind yeah. of like this lovely animal-like creature, like part penguin, part otter, part uh, part bear, part seal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's see, what's the next thing I bookmarked here? Oh. Let's see. 
Oh, so I, I bookmarked something here about um, the, the Rasa and uh, it's a, a conversation between Ransom and the Rasa about uh, how they mate, essentially. Um, they, mate, uh, they mate for life monogamously, but they only mate for a brief period of their, their life. And they kind of, they don't understand the concept yeah. of the sexual impulse being out of, out of proportion. Right. So he'll try to explain something like, yeah. uh, someone going crazy with lust to them. And it's almost like he, he, uh, they don't quite get it until, or yeah. when they finally do get it, they only get it because they have some poetry that illustrates the yeah. idea for them, but that, that's not something they experience or do. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, it was Ransom. Tr uh, I was looking back to see what came before the bookmark. Um, Ransom trying to explain war to Hyoi, right? Um, what for? Asked Hyoi. It was difficult to explain. If both wanted one thing and neither would give it, said Ransom, would the other at last come with force? Would they say, give it or we kill you? What sort of thing? Well, food, perhaps. If the other had now want, wanted food, why should we not give it to them? We often do. But how if we had not enough for ourselves? But Mal Eldil will not stop the plants growing. He, oh, if you had more and more young, would Mal Eldil broaden the hundredment and make enough plants for them all? The Cerrone know that sort of thing, but why should we have more young? Ransom found this difficult. At last, he said, is the begetting of young not a pleasure among the Harasa? A very great one, Human. That's why we call it love. This is what we call love. If a thing is a pleasure, Human wants it again. He might want the pleasure more often than the number of young that could be fed. It took Kiyoi a long time to get the point. You mean, he says slowly, that he might do it not only in one or two years of his life, but again? Yes. But why? Would he want his dinner all day or want to sleep after he slept? I do not understand. But a dinner comes every day. This love, you say, comes only once while Haras lives? But it takes his whole life. When he is young, he has to look for his mate, and then he has to court her. Then he begets young, then he rears them, then he remembers all this and boils it inside him and makes it into poems and wisdom. But the pleasure he must be content only to remember? That is like saying, my food I must be content only to eat. <laughs> I do not understand. A pleasure is full grown only when it is remembered. You are speaking, Human, as if the pleasure were one thing and the memory another. It is all one thing. Um, so, yeah, so he always is having trouble understanding why, um, uh, why humans would want to uh, pursue uh, what you were saying, why they would want to pursue uh, further lust. Right, that they're based as you're saying. There's no concept of lust or gluttony on this world, right? That um, uh, that you you mate for the purpose of begetting young, and then once you have done that, you are done with that, right? And yeah. you don't you don't seek it again and again and again. Um, and he compares it to you know why. You know, if you wanted to do it again, that'd be like wanting to have dinner after you've already had dinner or wanting to sleep after you have slept. Right. <laughs> um, so there's a like on this world, which uh, uh, just FYI, as we learn, this is a world that uh, has does not have original sin, essentially. Yeah. Um, it's it's the world. It's it's a world that uh, Lewis can see is what the world would be like if original sin did not exist right so um so p pleasure in a world like this is uh is inherently self-limiting it, it's but what you know having sex or eating bring pleasure but it brings uh pleasure that is um proportionate essentially and it's not an uh it, the the functions for all of those things are understood and therefore they're only done for those functions and those not they're not done to excess essentially mm -hmm. yeah a Cu couple things i want to highlight about uh ransom and now is ransom again 
he initially sees the the Frasa as savages, right? He thinks, oh, well, these must yeah. be the slaves and the Sorns must be the masters of this society. Uh, Ransom imagines how he's going to write uh, titles of great books on the on the Malkandrian uh, language and how he's going to uh, build his reputation with that. At one point right. he thinks, well, maybe I should uh, try to Christianize these savages. And then he finds out that they, they're trying to Christianize him because they don't think he understands yeah. that there's only one, there's only one God, right? So immediate, uh, yeah. everything, all of his conversations with the Frasa undermine Ransom's uh, initial impression of them as savages. And even after he leaves them, he's not quite so sure that they aren't savages uh, a after all. Uh, he has a mental picture of the world or the universe that's completely different from their mental picture and little details like he almost starved to death. And then when they feed him, they feed him with basically like this pink grass that's everywhere. So if he had starved to death, he would have been, he would have starved to death surrounded by ed edible plants. <laughs> he, every, he, Ransom imagines he's in this dangerous world that's going to kill him at any point and the Sorns are going to kill him. And by stages, Ransom keeps finding out that this world isn't as sinful, alien, and dangerous as he imagined it so. to, to be. Yeah. Uh, another neat contrast is this almost kind of foreshadows the type of Hollywood fiction where the uh, Western man goes and meets the savages and then he finds out that the savages are actually better than the Western man. Pocahontas, Avatar, yeah. they're all kind of variations on this theme where basically like the white man learns that w Western civilization are the bad guys and the, and the savages are actually secretly the good guys. For Lewis, yeah. it's a much more developed and much more complete version of that story because when he explains the uh, Frost's worldview, they have reasons to believe what what they believe. Uh, that I think that they, they have this poem about a Frasa that starts thinking that everything that is one is actually two. So wherever, wherever he sees one thing, he thinks there are two things there. Finally, it loses yeah. its mind and wants to love two women instead of loving one woman. Now for them, that's just a story that they tell as kind of a, a poem or an absurdity. And it's yeah. the closest thing they have. It's the only reason they can even kind of come close to understanding what Ransom is trying to talk about when he talks about uh, l lust and war is they have a poem yeah. to illustrate the point to them. So they're intelligent and rational enough to understand the concept of sin, but they don't have an experience of sin, which is where, where the miscommunication between uh, ran Ransom and them is coming from. They're, they're actually rational creatures who don't have original sin, which is another important thing because if we think, well, if, if we didn't have original sin, would we just have stayed like naked in the Garden of Eden forever? Would we just be little children? For other no, no, no. In Lewis's uh, world, you can not have the fall of man or original sin, and you can have a rational, adult understanding of the world and and of human desire and sin. Right, and um, also interestingly, um, there is uh, an element of danger in this uh, sinless world as well, uh, and that kind of brings me to my next bookmark. De the death uh, exists and they have to fight, they have to hunt the Hanakra, right? So they have all this yeah, great yeah, poetry yeah. to write. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so we have here, um, yeah, so the Hanakra is our enemy, but he is also our beloved. We feel in our hearts his joy as he looks down from the mountains of water in the north where he was born. We leap with him when he jumps the falls, and when winter comes and the lake smokes higher than our heads, it is with his eyes that we see it and know that his roaming time has come. We hang images of him in our houses, and the sign of all the rasa is Nakra. In him, the spirit of the valley lives, and our young play at being Nunaraki as soon as they can splash in the shallows. And then he kills them? Not often them. The rasa would be bent rasa if they let him get so near. Long before he had come down so far, we should have sought him out. No, Human, it is not a few deaths roving the world around him that makes the Hana miserable. It is bent Hana that would blacken the world. And I say also this. I do not think the forest would be so bright, nor the water so warm, no love so sweet, if there were no danger in the lakes. Mm. So, um, uh, so that's interesting too. That not only on this sinless world do we have uh, a society that uh, that has pleasure and sex and all those things that uh, people 
uh, that people mistakenly believe would not exist in, in the absence of original sin. But we also have uh, the, the threat of death and the challenge of the predator essentially exists on this world as well. Um, so uh, that kind of, that points to something very interesting that, that in fact, that without the, that quote, that uh, the forest, we do not think the forest would be so bright nor the water so warm nor love so sweet if there were no danger in the lakes um, uh, really stood out to me because uh, in, in our world today, uh, we seem to be ha we seem to have this increasing obsession with being safe. Um, and uh, what this uh, section of the book uh, seems to emphasize, uh, and I think it's something that we should pay attention to in our modern safetyist culture is that uh, all the things that we perceive to be good, like love, you know, warm water, the pleasures of nature, those would not exist if there wasn't also that, that uh, undercurrent of danger mm -hmm. and risk. And that risk is something that, that rational creatures need in order to be developed rational creatures. And maybe like this will get developed more in Paralandra, but can you have a story without evil? Because on the one hand, you know, even even out of the Silent Planet, it starts when the bad guys kidnap Ransom, right? So the presence of evil is an incredibly important part of storytelling. I think what Lewis is trying to suggest with the Hanakra and the the, Fna, the the Frost is that you could have sort of the goodness or the adventure of of poetry without the existence of evil. So a good, like a, a Christian, someone working within a Christian worldview could write a poem with an evil character where the triumph over evil is the point of the poem. And Lewis is saying, yeah. even, even in a world without the fall or without evil, the, the goodness that we see in poetry and adventure stories uh, could have an existence without evil having like po poisoned the world. So for the harass, uh, the sort of like the romance of, killing the Hanakra and protecting their young. Uh, it becomes right. a source for them of kind of like li life and uh, romance and inspiration for their poetry without the fall of right. man. Yeah. Right. And it, you know, and the way it's described, uh, it's, uh, it's, they, they hunt and they kill this thing that could kill their children, but they also have a great respect for it because, yeah. uh, this Hanakra is basically fulfilling its purpose in the world, essentially, and being what it is. It's like a um, warrior respecting his opponent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, so he spends a, a great deal of time among Harasa uh, learning about their society. And then uh, eventually Ransom gets sent to the, the Sorn, right? Uh, and 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 there he learns that the sword are not what he originally perceived them to be, right? <laughs> uh, maybe one little point is after Ransom tries to hunt the Hanakra, he he hears from the Eldil for the first time, and he's never been able to right. see or heal, hear them before. It's almost like you can only see or hear them by seeing or hearing their effects on the world around them, like a glimmer of light or something like like music but they're, they're not like they're not like uh the eldil aren't like giant uh monsters or al aliens running around that they, they're you it's hard for someone to see them at at all almost like it has to be a trained uh uh consciousness of them or something right he he, he initially doesn't want to yeah. obey them when he hesitates to obey them Hross is killed shot by shot by weston uh right and this breaks uh, this breaks ransom a little bit because something so pure and something that he loves is now being harmed by his people, the, the human the human people. He he, he right. has a gut wrenching reminder of what it happens when you introduce sort of sinful and destructive humanity into into a sin into a sinless world. Right. So when he encounters the Sorn, 
they're, I guess they're like giant, they're, they're giant nerds, right? right? Uh, yeah. And again, his, his mental picture changes. When he first hears the Soren, he thinks, oh, bo boogeymen, ghosts, uh, skeletal creatures, right? And then the second time, yeah. may, maybe more like giants, maybe more like trolls, right? Like, like he's starting to have a more grounded view of, of these things and maybe more from hideous and scary to grotesque and stern, but not necessarily like monsters that want to eat me. Right. Right. Uh, I, I found another, uh, bookmark that, hold on, let me see. Oh yeah. So this was, uh, right after, uh, the, the finish of the hunt, he says when he recollected himself, they were all unsure, wet, steaming, trembling with exertion and embracing one another. It did not now seem strange to him to be clasped to a breast of wet fur. The breath of the rasa, which, though sweet, was not human breath, did not offend him. He was one with them. That difficulty, which they, accustomed to more than one rational species, had perhaps never felt, was now overcome. They were all hanau. They had stood shoulder to shoulder in the face of an enemy, and the shapes of their heads no longer mattered. And he, even Ransom, had come through it and not been disgraced. He had grown up. Um, so uh, so that's getting back to um, what you were saying uh, about him coming to love the Harasa, right? Um, but what I find interesting about this quote is that uh, it, this is uh, Lewis saying something about uh, the operation of prejudice, I think, mm -hmm. and that... Um, that prejudice disappears as soon as you work together towards a common goal, like yeah. killing a Hanaka, right? And so, to, cl to clarify for people who may not have picked it up, a Hanau is a creature with a soul, right? On our planet, yeah. we only have one kind of Hanau, man. On yeah. Melacandra, there are three kinds of Hanau, meaning they can recognize something that looks different from me and acts different from me is a Hanau. It, it has a soul. I can love it as a fellow creature with a soul. So he's getting to experience something like that for the first time. Right. It's something human beings can't experience unless we were to meet, you know, wonderful aliens that have, uh, that have souls that we could love, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we have, so, so he gradually comes to understand that uh, the, the Harasa are not the, the dumb savages he once thought they were. And then, as you say, when he encounters the Sorn and has extended uh, extended interaction with them, he realizes that they're not the, the scary boogeyman human sacrificers that he originally thought they were as well. So um, throughout this book, he's gradually, you know, slowly coming to understand that all of his human preconceptions of what this alien world would be like are incorrect. Later, the Soren challenges him on this directly, and it's it's with the Harasa that he had the experience. He felt it, and then later, when he's talking to the Soren, he thinks it through and he realizes it in his head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I remember uh, when he tries to get to the Soren, the the Harasa first just like send him off uh, and hope he doesn't die, uh, and he nearly freezes to death while trying to get to the Soren. And one of the first things that he knows is about the Soren is they have a bit more of a sarcastic personality. Like the Soren says, "Yeah, a, a Harasa would just send you off to die and then write a lovely poem for you about it." They don't fear death, and they're correct to do that, but they have a tendency to not avoid death when death could be could be avoided, right? So the Sorens yeah. almost have like this sardonic intellectual view of the world, but at the same time, right. they don't hate the Harasa and they don't condescend to the the, the Harasa. Uh, they, they respect the, the Harasa's poetry and courage and soulfulness. They, it's just like the Sorens are almost like the, the nerdy adult just trying to like kids you don't don't drop the knives on on your heads that, that that's the relationship <laughs> to the harasa very much like a loving family almost <laughs> yeah um let's see what am i looking at here i've got all these all these bookmarks 
while you're looking for it, I, I think there's also like a moment where the Sorn shows him their equivalent of a telescope and asks him to look yeah. through it at Earth. And so then he just yeah. tries to describe a telescope to his Sorn, and the Sorn seems to intellectually understand what a telescope is. And this, so Ransom basically gi gives up because he doesn't understand how the Sorn's technology could work like like a telescope when it, he. Uh, the Soren seems to think, oh yeah, my, my thing works exactly like uh, this telescope you described. So R Ransom uh, gives up. It's like when he tries to explain something to a Soren, it's like the Soren has the intellectual category for it, but it doesn't have the language or the word uh, word for it. Uh, he, he has a conversation where the Soren is trying to explain complex ideas to him, and Ransom only knows very few uh, words, right? So again, we're getting this theme of co complex idea Try attempting to be put into simple language for for ransom. The Sorns have the right. most knowledge of the cosmos and maybe the history of the Oyasa and how the the spiritual world relates to their physical reality. Were you able to find it? Uh, well, I found the next thing that I had bookmarked, which was uh, on uh, page one hundred nine. And I just need to figure out what the context is. Um, oh yeah, so so this is in the section where he is talking to the Soren, I believe. Um, so he's talking to the Soren, and it says uh, they were such at what he had to tell them of human history, of war, slavery, and prostitution. It is because they have no Ayarsa, said one of the peoples. It is because every one of them wants to be a little Oyarsa himself, said mm. Agre. They cannot help it, said the old Sorn. There must be rule. Yet how can creatures rule themselves? Beasts must be ruled by Hanau, and Hanau by Aldilla, and Adilla by Maladil. These creatures have no Adilla. They're like one trying to lift himself by his own hair, or one trying to see over a whole country when he is on a level with it, like a female trying to beget young on herself. So this is... Um, this, this is Lewis basically uh, writing a uh, defense of the necessity of hierarchy, essentially. Yep. That there is that there is supposed to be uh, a hierarchy in nature, that some things are meant to be below other things. Uh, in terms God, of, God, angels, and man, yeah. yeah God, angels, and man, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so two things about our world particularly struck their minds. One was the extraordinary degree to which problems of lifting and carrying things absorbed our energy. The other was the fact that we had only one kind of Hanau. They thought this must have far-reaching effects in the narrowing of sympathies and even of thought. Yeah. So your thought must be at the mercy of your blood, said the old Soren, for you cannot compare it with thought that floats on a different blood. Um. But so, yes, yeah, so we have this world uh, in which uh, the hierarchy of the cosmos is accepted, that the beasts are ruled by uh, the creatures that are sapient. The sapient creatures are ruled by the angels, essentially, and then everyone uh, answers to God, right? Um, and so, so I highlighted this because this is something that I know, you know, uh, in Lewis's day and today, many people find uncomfortable the idea that hierarchies are are built into nature and are meant to be a part of nature, right? <laughs> pure, pure egalitarianism um, doesn't like that, yeah. Yeah, pure egalitarianism definitely doesn't like that. Um, and let's see, what else have we got here? We have... Uh, was it when was it was it when he visited the Sorns that he found out about the older race of bird creatures that lived high in like the tall mountainous stru structures that that have that have gone extinct, or was that later he found out about them? I think I'm trying to remember. But yeah, you're right. At at some point in the book, he learns that there was a fourth race of Hanau, right? um that are no longer living right yeah. um and uh he also learns that the 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 former yarsa of earth 
uh, attacked Mars and that's why Mars is the way that it is, right? Yeah. That um, uh, that the surface of Mars is basically uninhabitable. And so, uh, you know, they they carved the the canals, right? The deep canals for the, the remaining canal of Mars to live in, right? And the warm um, water, warm water on a cold, cold planet. Yeah. 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 So, um, so that, so we, we gradually reveal over time that we gradually reveal that this is Mars and we reveal why Mars is the way that it is. And it's because of the, the, the bent creature that rules earth attacked Mars, uh, a long, long time ago. Right. right. And okay. it looks like yeah, yeah, this so, is yep. Yeah. Th this is when he learns that Earth's name, uh, as uh, as known by the spiritual, the, like the the other beings, yeah. is we're known as Thulcandra, the silent planet, because we're under we're under siege. Basically, the Oyarsa right. of Earth is being contained on that planet, so we can't bring his bent nature any anywhere else for the time right. being. Right, and 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 we learn that the the Eldil who who live on Earth are bent in the same way that mm -hmm. the Oryasa is bent, right? So yeah. um yeah. So this is where we get, you know, this trilogy's concept of Satan and how and Satan and his demons are now contained in the sphere of Earth, right? Yep. Um and the and in the heavens uh they don't have those things, right? Um Let's see this. My next bookmark here. Oh, so my next bookmark is the meeting between uh, the conversation between Weston and the uh, 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 and Malakandra, the Oyasa of Mars. Right. Um, so eventually, uh, Ransom is brought to to speak to the Oyasa. Of Mars, right? Oh, we're skipping. We're skipping uh, the pillful triggy. Oh, you want to talk about the pillful triggy too? But we the, he doesn't talk too much about him. He basically ransom has a yeah. short conversation with the piffle triggy, and the piffle triggy yeah. are, I guess, like artists, sculptors, uh, artists, engineers, engineers, and technicians. Yeah. yeah, and they mine their yeah. own resources. So, I think yeah. when uh, ransom explains mining on Earth, he explains it well. I think that our miners. Uh, they, they're told that they'll starve to death if they don't mine. So only miners mine and only artists create art. The, the piffle triggy is yes. thought is, well, how can you be a good artist if you don't understand, you know, what your materials are and how they're made and where they, where they come from. Right. So the best artists yeah. go mine the best materials to make the best yeah. art and sculptures. Right? Uh, right. And there's also this contrast where I think the Sorn care the, le the least about women and the piffle triggy care the most. <laughs> so <laughs> my, my thinking being maybe Lewis is saying like for the artists and the technical minded people, yeah. uh, maybe they're most interested in, my, this is my interpretation, but I think he's saying that the, they're the most interested in beauty. Therefore women have the most political power in, yeah. in, in their world or in, in their yeah. setup. Uh, mm -hmm. And I guess for the Sorns, it's more like they don't care uh, uh, about a beautiful Sorn lady unless she can publish like a great research paper on on cosmology or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's it's a brief little interlude, but that kind of like uh, maybe like in general, the races represent different. Uh, well, they definitely demonstrate different uh, intelligences or. Uh, capacities, right? Frasa for yeah. poetry and hunting, Piffle Triggy for uh, engineering and artistry, Sorn for theology and physics, right? Right. Uh, and I think maybe there's like a mind, uh, what, what, what would it be? It would be like the rational mind, the uh, the chest, the heart, the you know, the animal, yes. ferocious warrior, and the stomach, the desire right. to live, the desire to pro procreate, right? Uh, and now right, what's right. neat is like none of the three of them 100% map onto that, I think, uh, but they do kind of generally, they do generally fit that picture. Like the Sorns seem to be the most rational and head-like of, of the three yeah. of them. Yeah. Right, right. 
So anyway, uh, yeah, after that, he finally gets to meet Mel Melchandra. And did you have like a bookmark section? Yeah. yeah, so I have a bookmark section here. Um, so he finally gets to meet Malachandra and, uh, and Weston shows up, right? And Weston has uh, uh, a very like pigeon conversation with uh, <laughs> Malachandra about what he intends for the, uh, the future of mankind, essentially. Um, uh, it is well that I have heard you, said Oryosa, for, for though your mind is feebler, your will is less bent than I thought. It is not for yourself that you would do all this. No, said Weston proudly and Malachandrin. Me die, man live. Yet you know that these creatures would have to be made quite unlike you before they lived on other worlds. Yes, yes, all new, no one know yet, strange, big. Then it is not the shape of body that you love. No, me no care how they shaped. One would think then that it is for the mind you care, but that cannot be, or you would love him now wherever you met it. No care for him now, care for man. But if it is neither man's mind, which is as the mind of all other Hanau, is not Maladon maker of them all, nor his body, which will change. If you care for neither of these, what do you mean by man? This had to be translated to Weston. When he understood, he replied, me care for man, care for our race, what man begets. He had to ask Ransom the words for race and beget. Strange, said Uyasa, you do not love any one of your race. You would have let me kill Ransom. You do not love the mind of your race, nor the body. Any kind of creature will please you if only it is begotten by your kind, as they now are. It seems to me, thick one, that what you really love is no completed creature, but the very seed itself, for that is all that is left. Um, What's great so, about this conversation is Weston yeah. believes he is more intelligent than anyone. And the, yeah. the hilarious irony of it is that he's speaking like a little baby in their language. They're laughing at him yeah. because of how ridiculous he is. He can't see it because all he sees from his perspective, he thinks he's talking to a bunch of savages and he's got to intimidate them by right. be, by acting big and tough tw towards them. Right. Uh, uh, Malkandra basically walks Weston through his fa fallacy and Weston's pride is keeping him from, from seeing it. He doesn't particularly care... Uh, he he cares about the human race and propagating the human race, but he actually has like a lot of uh, nasty, a, a very nasty, condescending view of mo of most hu human life. He he cares more about right. the human race surviving than he cares about actual human beings. Human beings. And yeah. and then yeah, yeah, when he when he encounters aliens with souls and and life, he doesn't care about that because again. It, uh, it, it's it, it for him. It's always getting back to the perpetuation of the human race is is his god. Right, right. But yeah, but uh, so and that the reason why uh, this section strikes me so much is that is a that is a common feature I think of uh, uh, many of our intellectuals, both historically and today, that they speak all the time about uh, the advancement of humanity or about justice for all humanity. Um, yet uh, they betray in the way they behave that they act, they don't like real humans very much, right? Uh, they don't like, uh, you know, our messy, messy biology. They want to completely transcend that. Um, they don't like uh, how regular human beings think, how they love, how they uh, it, how they interact with each other, just an ordinary, uh, you know, daily Congress essentially. Um, so when they when they speak about ju justice and love and the advancement of humanity, what they have in mind is something that is very much it, it has no relation to real humanity as it exists on this planet. Uh, I um, love, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand is a Western yeah. perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and continuing on in this conversation. Uh, so Weston says, tell him said Weston, when he had been made to understand this, that I don't pretend to be a metaphysician. I have not come here to chop logic. If he cannot understand as apparently you can't either. Anything so fundamental as man's loyalty to humanity, I can't make him understand it. Right. So Ransom but, yeah. has to translate Weston's speech 
into Malachandrin. Right. And when he translates it, he, he takes all of the rhetorical flair out of Weston. So Weston's used to giving this speech yeah. and getting a lot of applause. And then Ransom has to translate it into, I will kill all life on this planet to make a, yeah. to make room for yeah. humans, right? <laughs> that's that's yeah. what happens when you take the dress the dressing off of it. Right. Uh, which, I mean, that's, that's basically right. When you look at these uh, philosophies that Weston is supposed to represent as a character, um, it, it, th these are all philosophies, in including the, the crap that we're dealing with now. They're all philosophies that are based on uh, verbal virtuosity, essentially. They're, they're based on uh, how well people can persuade you to believe it with their pretty words. But once you get down to the bottom of what these philosophies uh, uh, want or what these philosophies are proposing for all of mankind, it it does boil down to Ransom's translations of, I will kill all who now, right? Yeah. You know, so, um, uh, yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a very good commentary of uh, how a lot of these uh, supposedly hyper-rational, intellectual, uh, modern slash postmodern philosophies, how they actually work, right? Yep, um, yeah, you, obfuscate, you obfuscate the evil of the point by dressing it right. up in yeah. flowing language and uh, seemingly no noble sentiments, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But Ransom was unable to translate this, and the voice of Aryasa continued, I see now how the lord of the silent world has bent you. There are laws that all Hanau know of pity and straight dealing and shame and the like, and one of these is the love of kindred. He has taught you to break all of them except this one, which is not one of the greatest laws. This one he has bent till it becomes folly and has set it up thus bent to be a little blind Aryasa in your brain. And now you can do nothing but obey it. Though if we ask you why it is a law, you can give no other reason for it than for all the other and greater laws which it drives you to disobey. So um, so Aryasa is saying, uh, Aryasa is talking about um, making idols, essentially. He says that, that essentially, to, to translate into simpler speak, what the what Malachandra says is that Wesson has taken love of kindred and made it an idol above all other things, and and, and doing so he uh, he ends up breaking all of the other laws that are supposed to work in tandem with each other. Uh, to uh, goodness, goodness cannot be boiled down to one thing. It is a system of laws. Uh, that all must be followed in order for goodness to be accomplished. Um, but Weston has uh, broken that idea by taking one of the virtues, the love of kindred, and mm -hmm. and elevating it above all others. It's classic. It's it's a classic idolization of something, yeah. right? Um, and and that's a that's another feature that uh, a lot of the 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 crap philosophies that we have to deal with now. Um, that's another feature of those philosophies is they 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 boil down the world to basically one variable and they elevate that that above all other variables in the world right yeah uh, so Lewis, Lewis yeah. hates reductionism uh, yeah yeah there's a line in one of the Narnia books where one of the Pevensey children says well a star's a giant uh, ball of ga gas right and I think yeah. they respond well that's what a star is but that's not all a star is not even on your world that maybe right. a star is, but that's not all it is, right? The materialists right. are reducing everything to matter, therefore, they only see matter everywhere. So, when Weston is giving his epic evil speech, he literally doesn't see the OER. So, I, I remember this he makes a whole he he assumes that whatever voice he hears must be ventriloquism. So, he looks around, he sees an yeah. old uh, Hross that's sleeping and he directs all of yeah. and he yells at the Hross. And so everybody's laughing at him because he doesn't know who he's yeah. talking to. Who he's actually right. talking to. Right. And Weston says uh, in the same passage, me think no such person, me wise, new man, no believe all that old talk. <laughs> uh, it also foreshadows that when they talk about the bent one, Weston in his yeah. speech says, me side with, me on bent ones, 
side. Me like him, right? Yeah. Like he likes yeah. the striving. Yeah. He likes the romance of Satan. Satan's this struggler, this fighter, this rebel, rebeller against the authority of God. And uh, yeah. Weston finds that romantic and uh, without knowing who the bent one is, has already declared himself yeah. to be on the bent one's side, which will become important yeah. in Paralandra as well. Yeah. Uh, and continuing on, I will, uh, do you know why he has done this? Me think no such person, me wise, new man, no believe all that old talk. I will tell you, he has left you this one because a bent now can do more evil than a broken one. He has only bent you, but this thin one who sits on the ground, he has broken for he has left him. He has left him nothing but greed. He is now only a talking animal. And in my world, he could do more evil than an animal. So that's what that goes back to what I was saying earlier about um, Lewis's conception of evil. He had, in the characters of Weston and Divine, he has two different versions of what sin would look like. And in the case of Divine, it's uh, it's basically the animalistic kind of sin, where you're just you're that Divine is basically uh, uh, a slave to his own impulses, right? Yeah. Uh, and so divine is basically the animal version of sin, whereas Weston is like the, the right rationalized idealist version of sin, which is the much more dangerous version of sin. Um, uh, and Malachandra says, if he were mine, I would unmake his body for the now in it is already dead. Yeah. But if you were mine, I would try to cure you. Tell me, thick one, why did you come here? Um, so... Uh, so certain kinds of sin reduce you basically to the level of the animal, right? And uh, and those are the less dangerous sins that uh, because as an animal you really can't do much damage, right? Uh, but the the uh, but Weston, the rational sinner, right? He's more dangerous because he retains uh, that rational aspect, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Uh, so uh, Malkandra considers erasing to unmake basically it's the same way that they kind of bury their dead is the physical matter right. that makes them up is sped up. So it's not like they're just incinerating you. It's more like you are moving into their plane of existence. I, I think one of the way they explain it is if someone moves faster, they're closer to being in two places at once. So if you were infinitely fast, then you would be uh, you would be omnipresent. You would be infinitely on, on in, in all places. So they move right. you into a, a, a space where you no longer you no longer have physical reality in the in the regular reality. Essentially, mm -hmm. uh, that's what the, he th threatens uh, Weston and Divine with. But they get a reprieve. They have ninety days to uh, prepare themselves, and then they're going to make a longer journey home. And it's going to be a lot more difficult because the planets have moved since, since last time. So it's going to take all of yeah. Weston's, uh, fi uh, physics know-how to, to, to get them back. Right. Right. Oh, uh, and of course we, we can't skip the fact that they prescribe, uh, Weston with having too much blood in the head. So, uh, to cure him, his, he must be repeatedly dunked, have his head dunked in cold water. Weston doesn't know what they're doing or that they're trying to help him. So if, to him, it must just seem like they're wa waterboarding him. But the, the, him, yeah. the, the final <laughs> gag is that Weston assumes something horrible. They must be killing him while they're actually trying, they're actually trying to help him, uh, which is beautiful because that's the mistake Ransom made when he first came here. Ransom's learned his lesson and he's learned about uh, the, yeah. the now of this world and the Oyarsa of this world. Weston still doesn't quite get the, the, the entire nature of this world. So he imagines there's a danger uh, to him that's not really there at all. Right. Yeah, so then we have this uh, much longer, much more challenging trip back, <laughs> right? Yep. Um, and I have something highlighted on page 157 in my version. Um, let's see, let me get to the actual context of it. Uh, as they're lifting off the planet, uh, each minute more hundred minutes came into view, long straight lines, some parallel, some intersecting. 
some building triangles, the landscape became increasingly geometrical. The waste between the purple lines appeared perfectly flat. The rosy color of the petrified forest that conjured for its tint immediately below him. But to the north and east, the great sand deserts of which the Sorens had told him were now appearing as illimitable stretches of yellow and ochre. To the west, a huge discoloration began to show. It was an irregular patch of greenish blue that looked as if it were sunk below the level of the surrounding Harandra. He concluded it was the forest lowland of the Piffle Triggy, or rather one of their forest lowlands, for now similar patches were appearing in all directions, some of them mere blobs at the intersection of hundreds, some of vast extent. He became vividly conscious that his knowledge of Malachandra was minute, local, parochial. It was as if a sword had journeyed 40 million miles to the earth and spent his stay there between Worthing and Brighton. <laughs> he reflected that he would have very little to show for his amazing voyage if he survived it. A smattering of the language, a few landscapes, some half-understood physics. But where were the statistics, the history, the broad survey of extraterrestrial conditions, which such a traveler ought to bring back? Those hondramits, for example, seen from the height which the spaceship had now attained and all their unmistakable geometry, they put to shame his original impression that they were natural valleys. They were a gigantic piece of engineering about which he had learned nothing, feats accomplished if, it were, if all were true before human history began, before animal history began. Or was that only mythology? He knew it would seem like mythology when he got back to Earth, if he ever got back. But the presence of our Yarsa was still too fresh a memory to allow him any real doubts. It even occurred to him, and this is the part I highlighted, that the distinction between history and mythology might be itself meaningless outside mm. Earth. Yeah. So uh, so I highlighted that because, again, um, it, what we said very early on, that one of C.S. Lewis's grand projects here is to restore the validity of mythology in the way that we conceive the world and the way that we understand it. Yep. So this is basically stating that the distinction between history and mythology might itself be meaningless outside the earth. Um, so yeah, yeah so Lewis believes that there is something that, that there's something true in the mythology. Yep. That, uh, like Tol yeah. Tolkien's myth, Tolkien's poem, Mythopoeia, probably uh, having a lasting impact on Lew on Lewis. Right, correct. Uh, yeah, so that uh, that takes us more towards the the end of the book, right? Um, and as you said, there is a little part at the end where uh, we have this kind of letter from Ransom to C.S. Lewis about all the things that he screwed up, <laughs> which is great. Um, and this really interesting section where they talk about how, well, we want to communicate what happened to me under the guise of fiction as a way... Uh, as a way of maybe introducing this idea to people and at least getting them to stop calling outer space space, right? So right. that's kind of like why I was yeah. joking about it. it's it's a weird irony that this is called the space trilogy, given that we know that a whole <laughs> point of of the books is stop calling it space. It's space. Uh, yeah. Make that a hashtag. Yeah. Yeah, the space trilogy is not about space. Right. Or it's not. It's not the space trilogy, uh, yeah. which you know opens up the question: What would we call it? instead do you think i've heard cosmic trilogy i've heard ransom trilogy i've heard yeah. heavens trilogy uh yeah yeah th that's the that's the tricky thing or you could just call it sci-fi trilogy because that's still that's the yeah. general genre of it yeah well it's, 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 i was gonna say it's more like science fantasy than science fiction but it's almost like science myth than science fantasy yeah. right <laughs> or um Another term that I, I've seen around that might apply to is a, a planetary romance. Okay. Because uh, that that term seems to apply to other things that were written kind of in this same period and earlier in which you have a Mars on which, you know, there are alien kingdoms and, yeah. uh, you know, monsters and things like that. So it might fall into that bracket as well. Yeah. So C.S. Lewis's planetary romances. It was also with, interesting uh, to me how much he referenced he referenced H. G. Wells a lot. Well, I'm yeah. almost like the whole point is he's trying to make a completely completely different category of science fiction from an H. G. Wells, but he's a much he's enough of a gentleman that he'll sort of pay respect to H. G. Wells while doing like a yeah. one eighty degree different take than than what Wells would do. Yeah. Yeah. Um uh, and uh, 
I, I was saying earlier that, so we have planetary romance with a dash of dystopian fiction at the end. <laughs> um, Cause that's where we get the hint that Weston and divine are part of a bigger network that we're, we haven't right. seen fully yet. We'll see more. Yeah. When we, when we talk about the, the later two books, yeah. Then we see that the, well, the purpose of this book was to introduce the, the heavens and how they actually exist. Right. Um, and what's in the heavens and how they're constructed. Right. Uh, and and Paralandra uh, furthers that uh, that reflection on uh, the heavens and how well uh, Paralandra is basically um, ah, we'll talk about it in the next video of this nature uh, because Paralandra is going to be the next video in the series um, that but just to preview it it's basically. Um, it's like retelling the story of Adam and Eve if Eve had successfully avoided sinning, essentially, <laughs> uh, with some help, right? So, um, and then and then it concludes with that hideous strength, which happens on Earth and basically takes all the things that we've learned in Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra and then applies it to this conflict that is building on Earth, right? Yep. So, yeah. Um, the old, so if Malachandra is the old, Paralandra is the new, that hideous strength yep. is the present. Yeah. Always like these nice yep. categories of three. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So do you have any final thoughts before we close the stream for tonight? Uh, I read it, I think a year ago, I reread it just for this stream. Uh, I was really stoked by that hideous strength, but uh, yeah. I think what I appreciate about the first two books is they are introducing complex concepts that I think you need just to get through, just to get through. The Hideous Strength is one of the weirdest books I have ever read. So it's, it's really nice to have at least like these basic concepts of how the world works before you walk into it. And even out of the silent planet, he's hitting you with a lot of stuff right off uh the bat. So I think I started with this and I, I think I'll finish with it. It's the best example I've ever seen of a book where the second time you read it, you have a completely different impression compared to the first time mm -hmm. uh, you read it. The main character's journey is parallel directly within the reader's mind. If you're paying attention while, while, while you're reading, you, you will come away right. from this book looking at the entire universe in a different light. Right. Which, um, in, in my view, I think that's one of the, the purposes of science fiction as an entire genre is to, is to, uh, to replicate in fiction that, that concept of a discovery of something that you didn't know before. Um, and kind of, and kind of instilling a sense of wonder in the universe. Uh, uh, yesterday I finished reading a book that is also structured kind of similarly in the sense that uh, the, the character, the main character finds himself in a strange environment and gradually learns over time what it is he's there to do, right? Um, and, uh, and what exactly is the truth of this uh, setting that he has found himself in, right? And mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a lot of the, the really, really good science fiction, in my opinion, has that aspect of mystery to it or, or that aspect of uh, going beyond what man once knew about, uh, about the universe, right? Um, and, that, and that's an element that is, uh, that in my view and the, and the view of a lot of people who hang around in my milieu, that's missing in a lot of, the current day fiction that calls itself science fiction is that sense of discovery and wonder of things we did not originally know about the universe, right? Um, so, but C.S. Lewis, def although C.S. Lewis is more uh, more Christian than I think a lot of his uh, uh, contemporaries, right? Uh, he still fits well within that tradition of uh, you know, uh, bringing forth that discovery narrative, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of my final thoughts on the matter. 
All right. So we got to do Par- Paralandra sometime soon. Yes, we do. And Warzard says, uh, I read these back in the 90s. I need to reread them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely do. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting concepts here. It's they're not um, they're not action packed books really until you get to that hideous strength, but they are um, they are very interesting reflective pieces that force you to really think about uh, uh, how we how we actually conceive of uh, the cosmos essentially. The- the interstellar soundtrack meme would be the perfect uh, pairing for what happens <laughs> as you read out of the sign of the planet and then yeah. the, the, the thrumming, you know, boise of the orchestra keep building to this bigger and bigger crescendo within your mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's what I always want to feel. I think that's what I'm really, that's ultimately what I'm looking for when I'm reading science fiction is I'm looking for that feeling of, I'm looking for that feeling of, wow, right? That I'm looking for that building crescendo. I'm also looking for, so, uh, in any of the fiction I read, including comics, I'm also looking for genuine human emotion too. So, um, but that, that definitely that building, that building crescendo, that sense of wonder, uh, that sense of discovery uh, is an essential component. I agree. Very good. Kind of a mirror image to Lovecraft space. Oh yeah, but where yeah. but for Lovecraft, you would be like, there's this cosmic space uh, really reality, good, yeah. but it's terrifying, right? It's always yeah. interesting to me how like uh, Lovecraft is. Re- it's like he has the atheist version of the galaxy brain thing, where if there is a god yeah. and you hate God, then it becomes like the most horrifying uh, so thing in existence. Imagine, yeah. But it's also <laughs> other and yeah. greater than you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th- yeah. So I think he's right there. That um, Lewis and Lovecraft both see uh, the cosmos as something beyond what what man has so far conceived. The difference is that Lewis sees it as something that is invigorating, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and maybe- whereas Lovecraft sees it as terrifying. Yeah. That, back to the mental picture thing. So for the medieval person. Yeah. They, they don't necessarily see uh, like, well, they would have like really real painful things like the plague, you know, reminding them of the existence of death, but they wouldn't feel yeah. out, so out of place in the world. Whereas we get into the modern imagination and we have this weird out of placeness. Like I'm a stranger in a strange land. I don't quite feel like I fit in the world or the universe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's like the difference between looking at space and saying, wow, I'm so small. I'm on a little, dust speck and I could just be erased from existence and looking up at space and saying, wow, it's beautiful. Right. Right. Yeah. Like both of them have like yeah. a sense of the sublime or a sense of awe, but one is sort of a yeah. depressing sense of awe. And the other is more like an uplifting wondrous sense of awe at it all. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and uh, my brain is now thinking of uh, something I heard when I went to uh a very, very tiny convention at a lo- local Orthodox church uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and they were talking, the pr- purpose of the convention was to talk about, um, to, tar- to talk about science fiction and fanish stuff uh, from the perspective of Orthodox Christianity, which, you know, I'm not Orthodox, but hey, they're also my allies. So I thought it'd be interesting to go and see. And, um, uh, one of the speakers there was talking. Uh, he had sub, he had divided human history into uh, three seculars. Essentially, he calls them, and he was saying like the, the first secular is the medieval conception of the world, where there is essentially no division between. Uh, in the medieval conception of the world, there's no division between what you do on a daily basis to uh, survive and so on, uh, and the divine. It's all one thing. Okay. Right, and, and we see, and we see, uh, we see in how the 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 Harasa and the Soren and all the other Malachandrians that how they see the world is one cohesive thing, right? Mm-hmm. Their um, way of life then, is intensely connected to their religious life. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you have the second secular where um, the the division happens, 
and you have the things that are divine, the things that are part of the religious life, and now the things of the, the ordinary life, now there is a division between them. So your, da your daily living is now something that is separate from the religious conception, right? Okay. Uh, so then that division happens and then, and then finally in the third secular, the religious life disappears. Right. Mm. So, <laughs> and so all you have is the materialist space. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, uh, so we can say here that, uh, that um, out of the silent planet uh, in particular is uh, Lewis's attempt to recapture uh, what the experience of life must have been in the period of the first secular in which uh in which the religious life and the ordinary life are all one cohesive thing right and it's so uh, foreign from us that when he reintroduces it in a sci-fi context it feels like we're encountering yeah. countering alien races that we've never heard or thought right. of before yeah right yeah H history because at the time at I the time that, that uh, Lewis I, I think that Sorry. ransom says something like well they've closed that path off to us to the heavens. So what we're going to have to go yeah. back, uh, we might have to invent time travel before we can in, uh, gauge in space travel again, right? Like they become fascinated yeah. by the idea of the medievalists, uh, medieval <laughs> sci-fi stories, medieval stories about traveling into outer space. Ransom believes that in history could be this uh, pathway to understanding the, re the real cosmos or the real heavens, right? So ra again, right. Ransom is coming to a realization similar to Lewis, which is we need to go back in time to find our roots right before we can move forward. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Because Lewis, uh, Lewis is right from the perspective of someone living in the third secular, right? Realizing that something has been taken from human experience, right? That there's something that's missing that used to be there, right? So, uh, and I think that's a pretty good place to end, I think. Um, All right. So thank you, number one Marmaduke fan, for once You're again welcome. being a uh, more uh, More Iron Man be and more uh, dystopia and galaxy brain, uh, not, not space books <laughs> coming in the exactly. future. Yes. So thank you very much, Warzard, for coming in. And for all of you who will be listening to this asynchronously, again, thank you for listening. And uh, next time, more fun stuff to discuss. Love you guys. Catch you later.